In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful. Madam President, Nesad Shamim Khan, Your Excellency Ambassador Volkan Boske, President of the General Assembly, Excellency Antonio Guterres, Secretary General, Excellency Madam Michelle Bishlet, High Commissioner for Human Rights, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, at the outset, I'd like to congratulate you, Madam President, for assuming the presidency of the 15th cycle of the Human Rights Council and wish you and the Bureau a successful year ahead. It is an honor to address the Human Rights Council to reaffirm Afghanistan's unwavering commitment to protect, promote, and fulfill human rights and fundamental freedoms, as well as our unequivocal support to the noble mandate of the Council, the UN Human Rights Mechanisms and the activities of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. We, the people of the United Nations, meet in the context of unprecedented global turbulence. COVID-19, the changing nature of violence and war, climate change, the fourth industrial revolution, and transformation of technology, and the explosion of inequality, each constitute a distinctive form of disruptive change. Their simultaneous occurrence and entangled interactions produce a hyperphenomenon, marking a break between our assumptions, routines, and habits of the past. Confronting our collective global challenge requires a global review, similar to the imagination and cooperation that give us the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the United Nations, and the Bretton Woods institutions. The scale and scope of the challenges facing our interconnected world bear on every article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, requiring review and restatement. The question is not the enduring relevance of the vision, but issues arising from success and the radical change in context. Human rights are almost universally accepted, as reflected in the constitutions of most of the countries of the world. Respecting may be a different matter, reflecting the degree to which the processes of state building and market building have been citizen focused and rights based. The challenge now is renewal of global consensus on moving from the discourse of human rights to the practice of human rights. Hence, the urgency of exploring the impact of the five drivers of global turbulence in relation to renewal of commitment to the preamble that the recognition of the inherent dignity of the, inequal, of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. The foundational right for us, the Afghan people and government, is the right to peace. Subject to 40 years of violence, the right that we yearn for most is the right to life, liberty, and the security of the person within a sovereign, democratic, and united country. The toll on our livelihood and lives has been immense. The World Bank estimated the material loss between 1978 and 2001 at $240 billion. The human loss is commonly estimated at 1.5 million killed, 2 million internally displaced, and 9 million forced to become refugees. The scale and scope are of suffering continues. The Global Terrorism Index, to take one example, estimates the damage inflicted by the Taliban on our GDP in 2019 at 18.6%. Afghan refugees still living in Iran and Pakistan are estimated at 5 million respectively. The number of disabled is 152,000 and internally displaced at 400,000. Mere numbers do not capture the extent of our tragedy. The recent wave of violence against our people, civil and civic institutions, from human rights and civil society organizations to the media, judicial, civil service and security organizations to farmers and traders or indications of a systematic onslaught against our society. Targeted killings are the sharp edge 
directed against men and women, representing the profound transformation of our society during the last 20 years. Its issue is not just the continuous nature of violence inflicted upon us during the past 40 years. Even worse is the phenomena of unrestricted warfare. Colonels Xiao Liang and Wang Jiang Xu argued in 1999 that warfare will soon, I quote, transcend all boundaries and limits. The battlefield would be everywhere, and the boundaries lying between the two worlds of war and non-war, of military and non-military, will be totally destroyed." End of quote. Tragically, their prediction has become a reality. We, the people of Afghanistan, suffer on a daily basis from the effects of unrestricted warfare. What becomes of the promise of universal declaration of human rights? Clearly, the institution of post-World War II if proven inadequate to preventing the recurrence of the barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind. The answer, however, surely does not lie in discarding the universal acceptance of human rights. As Rosa Brooks argues, the best route to upholding human rights and the rule of law lies in recognizing that war and peace are not binary opposites, but lie along a continuum. We can accept the word as it is, but change the categories we used to make sense of it and develop new rules in institutions to manage the paradox of perpetual war. When we developed our first constitution in 1923, we were the only fully sovereign country in the Muslim world. The discourse of rights and obligations enshrined in our first constitution was developed by a remarkable group of scholars from Afghanistan, India, and the Ottoman Empire, reflecting a century of state building within the dominant norms of Islamic thought and practice. Our current constitution of 2004, enshrining a clear commitment to the principles of human rights, respect both for the UN Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, builds on the cultural foundations of our first constitution in our Islamic beliefs, culture, and civilization. The rights of citizens articulated in Chapter 2 of our Constitution are not moral injunctions, but fundamental rights constituting the constitutive and regulative rules of the state, society, and economy in the interrelations and check and balances of three branches of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Despite the intensity of violence, Afghan citizens, men and women, girls and boys, old and young, rural and urban, religious scholars and civil society activists have found common ground in the categories of citizenship in the Republic as enshrined in the Constitution. Accountability for adherence to and respect for human rights, therefore, is not grounded in responding to external pressures, but flow from a rich and lively sets of agreements and disagreements among equal citizens, making our history and attempting to secure our future to overcoming our tragic past. I'll spare you the numbers, as the UNAMA reports both document our efforts and our challenges. I can, however, categorically state that the majority of our citizens, fully 70.6% of whom are under the age of 30, are now not only familiar with the notions of fundamental rights, but frame their dialogue and demands from their government as citizens empowered by the Constitution. Achieving peace is our national quest. There's a national consensus on the end state of a sovereign, democratic, united Afghanistan. It peace within and with the world, incapable of preserving and expanding the achievements of the past 20 years. We are in a historically rare moment when a just and lasting peace can be achieved through a political settlement. The Afghan people and the government have the commitment, conviction, and courage to demonstrate the sense of urgency required in such an open moment. Difficult choices will have to be made to move from being a battlefield of unrestricted warfare to a platform of an Asian roundabout and international cooperation. Human rights, in general, and rights of citizens, women, girls, youth, 
in social categories. In particular, are going to figure prominently in the peace negotiations. What would be the advice of the human rights community in the stand of the Human Rights Council? We ask for your early engagement and constructive partnership to secure for generation of Afghans bearing the scars of war in the future generations that can enjoy the rights of peace. If war and peace constitute a continuum today, surely moving from the purgatory of unrestricted warfare to lasting peace is worth the marshalling of all of our collective energies and imagination. We, the Afghan people in government, are placing our peacemaking efforts within a framework of international and regional partnerships around the aligned processes of state building, market building, and state building to reinforce our shared destiny as a unified nation. The Independent Human Rights Commission of Afghanistan is a constitution-based national human rights institution fully and robustly functioning according to the Paris Principles. It has consistently maintained its A status rating. The government of Afghanistan fully respects and cherishes the independence and impartial conduct of our National Human Rights Commission when we are committed to increase our financial contribution without restrictions. Finally, Madam President, in the last three years, as a member of this Council, Afghanistan improved and enhanced cooperation with the international human rights mechanisms. We paid serious attention to our commitments and pledges made during our candidacy. Under my direct instructions, the government of Afghanistan submitted six initial and periodic reports on the implementation of core human rights conventions, some overdue since Afghanistan first acceded to them decades ago. We also presented our third cycle UPR report, and we are tirelessly working towards the implementation of the recommendation received during the review. Afghanistan will continue to closely cooperate with the, U uh, with the UN human rights monitoring mechanism. As a council member, we prioritize the areas where a significant protection and global attention gap existed and contributed to filling the gap, including the rights of migrants and asylum seekers. Using experiences from this very first term, Afghanistan is willing and committed to serve and continue to build on its legacy of constructive engagement as a member for another term in 2023-25, for which we seek your support and cooperation. Excellencies, distinguished participants, at the end, once again, let me thank you for the opportunity. At a moment in history where the combined impact of disruptive forces puts into question the near universal acceptance of human rights, we need to work together to preserve the gains of the past by taking account of the change context and offer updated rule of law in human rights frameworks that can result in furthering the promotion of universal respect for and observance of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Afghanistan will be a steady partner in this journey of faith and imagination. Thank you.